For the second recording, I want to take a step back from the more advanced material and walk through a derivation that made reactive programming click for me back when I started studying it in earnest with RxSwift. Now, while I was mostly able to nod along with what I read back when, there was always this question in the back of my head of, where does reactive programming come from? And it wasn't until I watched Eric Meyer and Brian Brickman's 2014 Expert to Expert session that I found the answer, and then the pieces of abstraction like publishers and subscribers came together. I'm going to translate that derivation from C Sharp into Swift in hopes that it makes Combine's origins a bit more accessible for folks in the community. Because, as it turns out, if you've ever written a for loop or leaned on the sequence protocol, you've secretly used a mirrored version of Combine's foundational publisher type. So, let's start there. Sequence is a bedrock protocol for a paradigm you might see referred to as imperative programming. Imperative in that you're telling the program how to execute instead of stating its goal explicitly. For example, if we wanted to square the first 10 positive integers, a wild example, I know, we could do the following. First, we could allocate a squares buffer, and then we can iterate over the first 10 positive integers. And then along the way, we could append to that buffer the squared value. This is a lot of handholding. We're telling Swift to allocate a squares buffer, how to linearly iterate over one through 10, and appending the squares along the way. Hidden behind Swift's four keyword is the sequence protocol. The compiler actually rewrites the above with something similar to the following. Make iterator to sequence's sole requirement. It's a constructor that provides a cursor to call sites to step across a possibly infinite sequence. Since iteration can be non-repeatable, think for example reading in from a socket, iterator needs to be mutable to handle potentially destructive next calls. And that brings us to iterator protocol.next. It's a method from void to an optional element, and an iterator can return nil to signal reaching the end of a sequence. And in our case, um, the element is just integer, a plain old int, and we're binding it to this local variable name integer, and then appending it to squares afterwards. Sequence.makeIterator and iteratorprotocol.next are gonna be our pals in this derivation. The former is a method from void to a conformity of the iterator protocol, and the latter takes on a void to optional element shape. Spelling out the iterator protocol helps clarify things. The protocol itself clocks into under 10 lines, even with Apple's comments. If we squint hard enough, we can see that iterator protocol's core requirement is a function from void to an optional element, putting aside the mutating keyword for now. And that provides intuition for sequence's make iterator method. In its current form, it's a function from void to a conformance of the iterator protocol. But then now, with the observation that iterator protocol itself is practically a function from void to an optional element, we can actually inflate this a bit and say, instead of iterator protocol, we have another function from void to optional element. That's a lot of right arrows, <laughs> but bear with me. All we did was substitute the iterator protocol with its core, a function from void to an optional element. Now, let's zoom in on the iterator protocol.x method. It turns out this method has three possible outcomes. Can you list them? We got optional.sum element, check. Optional, dot ele or optional element dot none if we reach the end. Makes sense. And the third? Turns out the method can crash. In a sense, that's an implicit output that throwing makes explicit for call sites to catch. Let's include this crashing possibility in a type one case larger than an optional element. Let's call this type event. And similar to an optional, it'll be an enumeration that's then parameterized by two generics. And the first generic will mirror the associated type from the iterator protocol element. And then to explicitly represent a crash as a value, we can then lead on Swift's error protocol to constrain the second generic. So we'll call that second generic failure, and it'll conform to Swift's error protocol. And 
like mentioned before, um, event will need to be one case larger than an optional. So the first two cases for event will correspond with the optional.none and optional.sum cases. And then the third case will correspond to a crash, but instead of a actually crashing at runtime, we'll return a value that the call site can work with. So we'll first have case finished. And that corresponds to iterator protocol.next returning nil. Then we also have case value, and then we'll have it return an associated value of type element. And this will correspond to iterator protocol.next returning an optional.sum element. And then finally for the crasher, we'll do case failure with an associated value of that failure generic. And now we can actually take the inflated form of sequence.makeiterator and rewrite it instead of returning an optional element, we can have it return an event parameterized by that same element and then some given failure type. Now for an unexpected turn, quite literally. I'm gonna need you to suspend disbelief for a while and don't worry, I'll lift that suspension with some underlying theory afterwards. What if we flipped all the arrows in this signature, as in swap all outputs for inputs? To make that concrete, let's duplicate this line and instead of going from void to the core shape of iterator protocol.next, what if we accepted this right-hand side as input and return void? And similarly, on this function, what if instead of going from void to an event, we accepted an event and return void? Breaking this down, starting from the input side, we have a function that takes in an event that corresponds with either a finished event, a value, or a failure. And what's wicked is that we previously took a hidden crash, encoded it as a value, and are now considering it as input instead of output. And it turns out that this event to void structure is an event handler, or in combined speak, it's the subscriber protocol. Here's an abbreviated version of that protocol. At its core, subscriber is a protocol that has two associated types, one representing the input that subscriber can receive, and the other representing the different types of failures that it can handle. Now, as I mentioned, this is an abbreviated version, so we can actually ignore all the subscription-related parts of the subscriber protocol that I hit away, and then also the subscribers.demand return value for now. And again, these are important parts of the protocol, but for this purpose of this derivation, we won't actually need it. And then what's left is actually two methods, one corresponding to a handler for when the subscriber receives an input value, and the other representing uh, the subscriber receiving a completion. Now it turns out we actually handled um, the, this completion here in our event type, corresponding to the both the finished and the failure cases, because the full form of subscribers.completion is actually an enumeration with just simply two cases that we've already covered. And again, it's parameterized by a generic that's also constrained to Swift's error type, and similarly for the one that we did in event. So at its core, if we squint hard enough, it turns out that subscriber is essentially that same shape. It's a function from event to void, where the different event types are split across these two receive methods. The first case being when you receive an event dot value, that's covered by the receive input method. And similarly, for the event dot finished and event dot failure cases, that's covered by the receive completion method. So it turns out we can actually simplify this handler by substituting in subscriber. And this flip version now of sequence.makeiterator has been re reduced to a function from subscriber to void. And wait for it. It turns out the subscriber to void shape is exactly what's encoded by the publisher protocol. Here's an abbreviated form of it. Publisher protocol, similar to the subscriber protocol, has two associated types, one for the output of a given publisher and the other for the possible failure that the publisher can emit. And then the only method requirement on the publisher protocol is this receive method. And it turns out if we look past the constraints here, receive is a method from subscriber and then there's no return value. So it's a void return value. So at its core, the publisher protocol is a function from subscriber to void. And then if we think about it, <laughs> that's just the flip version of sequence.makeiterator that we derived below here. So it turns out we can actually reduce this entire thing down to publisher. Now let's pause with this for a second. If you take a flipped version of Swift's sequence protocol, you actually arrive at combines publisher protocol. 
And then on the inside, it turns out when we flip the iterator protocol on the return value side of here, sequence.make iterator, we got combines subscriber protocol. So it turns out that this entire time, if you ever use the Swiss sequence protocol or an underneath the hood from Swiss sequence protocol, the iterator protocol, it turns out you've actually been using the flipped version of combines subscriber and publisher protocols without possibly even realizing it. And that's actually where combine comes from. It is a dual to Swift's sequence type. Duality is a concept borrowed from a branch of math called category theory. Without digging in too deeply, each construction in the field has a notion of directionality that can be reversed to build another construction of equal, albeit flipped footing. It turns out that functions in Swift can be viewed as, with some fudging, categorical objects and subsequently have their arrows flipped. So the opposite of imperative programming's sequence protocol is combines publisher protocol. And that lens grounded my intuition over the years as I wrote more and more reactive code. And while combine is what reflects back when we hold the sequence up to a mirror, that doesn't necessarily mean it isn't complicated. That difficulty comes from the fact that most engineers today and educational material is geared towards imperative programming. Learning the reactive side of the coin is like learning to program for the first time again. And trust me, it's worth it. If you want to dig further into combine, I'm working on an advanced combine book that I'll release later this summer. And until then, I hope this derivation helps folks in the same way that Meyer and Beckman's did for me back when. I've also linked out to some related reading in the notes below. Thanks.